the next abstract uh, will be presented by Dr. Ibrahim al Maglour. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to present my work. This was uh, part of uh, my uh, graduate degree uh, requirements, and I hope to show you a little bit of uh, what we and what we what I have been doing and what uh, things we can do in the near future. Um, excellent. So the topic is really about the. Uh, the risk of infection in patient with systemic lupus erythematosus adult patient, and particularly we're focusing on the acquired low immunoglobulin. I have no relevant disclosures, and the outline goes over introduction, aims, method, results, conclusion, and future direction. Now, as you all know, systemic lupus erythematosus is really a multi-factorial uh, disease, and it also affects so many organs. The problem is that lupus patients have increased risk of uh, mortality. They have three times the risk of mortality compared to the general population. Now, well, if we look at the drivers of these mortality risk, we will find that cardiovascular disease, infection, and uh, renal disease dominate really the uh, causes of mortality. However, infection are a very interesting part that was underrepresented in terms of studies of lupus. The reason is the risk of infection maintained throughout the disease, even if, you are, if your disease is really controlled or at the beginning. Hence, we have really a major challenge that can contribute to patient, more, uh, patient risk. Now, the second part, which is very important, is that the infection rate is not that high. And this is a problem when you do any study in a rare disease. So in order to study this further, our aim of this study was to examine the association between acquired low immunoglobulin, which could be an immunological risk predisposition to uh, infection, and the outcome of interest is clinically relevant infection. So keep this in mind. We can define it later. We also uh, want to assess whether acquired low immunoglobulin is a transient phenomenon in patients with lupus and whether they recover over time. Now, without going into too much details, the challenge of this study was done on a, a prospective collected data, so that's a very good quality of data. The problem is there are a lot of confounders that can cause low immunoglobulin in patients with lupus that also can contribute to infection. Now, in order to overcome this, we did a lot of methodological statistical uh, uh, techniques in order to account for that. The outcome of interest is really clinically relevant infection, which means any infection that requires any antibiotic, whether oral or IV, so the one that you care about as a clinician and rheumatologist. Now, how we balance both groups, so group who has low immunoglobulin and the group who doesn't have low immunoglobulin in order to have a really uh, less confounded, less biased study. We did something called propensity score. We can talk about it in the future, but the idea is really to create a pseudo-randomization. You want both groups to be similar. And the final part is that the primary analysis was time to event analysis using Cox regression modeling. There was multiple sensitivity analysis that was done and the aim is really to ensure that what we are referring to is really true. Okay, so the results, the uh, cohort creation, this is the, one of the largest cohorts on earth for lupus. We have uh, about 2,000 patients with lupus uh, that was started since 1970. And we have, uh, we, uh, the final point that you want to see is really the one on the uh, lower part, which is the exposure and the control group. So the people with low immunoglobulin were about 400 patients, and the control group was about 600 patient. Uh, the details of the exclusion were highlighted above. Now, what I was trying to highlight here, this is the baseline characteristic difference between both groups. And if you can see, you will see the highlighted in yellow, the difference between low immunoglobulins and the control group, i.e., patients who have low immunoglobulin are more likely to, be, to have longer disease duration, more likely to have history of lupus nephritis, they are more likely to have proteinuria at the time of the low immunoglobulin, and they also have more prednisone use and immune suppressant. Then they will tell me, well, huh, both groups are not the same, 
your low immunoglobulin group by default have increased risk of infection because of steroid and immune suppressive agent and all other confounders. Hence, we did the propensity score methods. And this table, which is busy, and I do apologize for it, just look at the far right side of the table, you will see that the difference between both groups have changed dramatically after applying propensity score, i.e. that when you do the inverse um, the propensity score match or what we call inverse probability weighted, both groups look very similar. And this results are almost better than a randomized trial using the same sample size. Okay? Now, without going into further details, the first result is we found that low immunoglobulin or acquired low immunoglobulin, particularly low IgA, is associated with increased risk of infection within uh, two years of this uh, uh, abnormality. And you can see that on the first uh, graph of the kaplan meier the other two immunoglobulins, which is IgG and IgM, did not increase the risk of infection. Is that surprising? We have a lot of data on the rituximab studies that shows that low IgG does not usually increase the risk of infection compared to the general population. So that's not really surprising. However, the IgA really raised a major question of why those people have increased risk can talk about that further. Now, just to augment the uh, information and make convince you more, this was persistent despite any use of different propensity score method, i.e., regardless of what uh, statistical model do you, do you do, you will find the same results, i.e., you have more confidence about the uh, results than a usual uh, study. Now, the summary of the main finding, only acquired low immunoglobulin, IgA, was associated with increased risk of infection. And hear me, I'm saying associated, not a causality, because you can't really refer causality in a usual setting. Now, the results were consistent, and what we also found, and I did not show that, that when you have a low immunoglobulin, in patients with lupus, the normalization, when they go back to the normal level, they have reduced risk of infection. Now, um, I didn't present this because it will add more confusion to the audience, but it is very interesting phenomena when you look at the immunoglobulin replacement. However, these findings were not persistent on all sensitivity analysis, so you take it with a grain of salt. Now, the second part, when we have a low immunoglobulin, are they transient or are they persistent? And of course, uh, uh, we looked at this. The, uh, this is the largest and the first study that looked in into this in details. And you can see that 60% of the patient with uh, lupus, when you do the immunoglobulin and find them low, they will recover over four or more years. Uh, the rest usually persist, about 40%. The second question will say, huh, are they different? And the, result, the answer is no. Both uh, groups are similar in terms of important outcomes. Now, the conclusion uh, is similar to what I said. Acquired low immunoglobulin are important to consider in your clinical practice, particularly when you have someone who is at increased risk because you might do something about them. You either modify the immune suppressive agent, reduce their steroid, or even consider immunoglobulin uh, replacement. We can talk into that into details. That was not highlighted in that part of the study. The second part is that the majority of immunoglobulins are transient. They are likely to recover over time in lupus patient. Uh, without going to strength and details, um, I hope that I convinced you with different models that we are trying to find the truth or be as close to the truth as possible. And the limitation is uh, simply this is an uh, observational study. So, uh, and that's the only way you can do such study because you can't randomize patient to have a low immunoglobulin or not. Now, future direction, we really want to understand this phenomenon further, and I think we can do more studies about that in our population. I would like to um, uh, tell you that in uh, King Saud University uh, College of Medicine, we are establishing, hopefully soon, uh, a cohort for lupus, and that will be, uh, everyone will be welcomed. It should be on a national level. We are trying to collect data, understand our patient phenomena, and I heard a lot of excellent talk about collaboration, so hopefully in Next year, we can see that as a reality rather than chit chat and talks. Have a great day. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Brani, for any this questions? excellent abstract. Uh, any question regarding this? Yes. Thank you so much, Dr. Dr. Mahlou. Just my question regarding this low immunoglobulin. Any um, role of uh, being consumed 
with the immune complex like complement and this hence that they will develop lupus nephritis or this is just a primary you know plasma cells uh, dysfunction so do you have any clue why they have this phenomena and association excellent excellent question thank you so uh, I think the short answer is for to correlate it with the disease activity uh, you can see that people with high disease activity may or may not have low immunoglobulin so it doesn't always correlate with the consumption of immunoglobulin and deposition of immune complex however if you want to see the, say what are the causes for it you can see that people with low immunoglobulin although that beyond the scope of this talk were more likely to be uh, to have proteinuria so one factor that can contribute to that is the uh, ongoing proteinuria. Of course, nephrotic range proteinuria is really a risk factor for uh, hypogammaglobinemia. The second part is that there are data to suggest that there are B cell dysfunction and uh, abnormality with the B cell production of immunoglobulin in context of uh, immune suppressive use, regardless of which kind of immune suppressive use. Of course, especially those immune suppressive that has a direct effect on B cells, such as cyclophosphamide or rituximab. So it's more likely to be a multifactorial rather than one specific, one specific cause. I have one more question. So, um, according to your data, that uh, they included 2,000, right, lupus patients? Yes. Okay. So during that time, do you have a special including criteria in this patient or exclusion criteria? Sorry, including criteria or exclusion criteria? Like, for example, lupus patient with lupus nephritis, any major organ involvement? Of course, it's going to affect the immunoglobulin level. This course, patient. But I, sorry, I didn't hear the first part. My, no, no, I mean, what I meant that you do have like 2,000 lupus patients in your data. Yes. So any major organ involvement in this patient? Excellent, excellent point. So, uh, of course, the, if w I didn't break down the uh, SLE day, uh, uh, which is essentially uh, breaks to you the organ involvement. Yeah. So they do. You will see that about 40% had lupus nephritis, so it represents what you usually see with patients with lupus. You have patients with cardiac involvement and CNS involvement. But however, I think the major part, the major question is whether they are equal in both groups or not, and they actually are after the use of propensity score. So okay. we created this pseudo-randomization. Right. So the second part, um, at that time when you are collecting your data, do you have any patient with active infection at that time or you excluded patient with infection? Excellent. So uh, uh, the data are collected prospectively since 1970. Uh, the uh, the uh, patient, the results that you saw was really at the time of their uh, first acquired low immunoglobulin. Okay. So your question, the second question is, what were their disease activity at that time? Mm -hmm. And actually you will see that the majority, the disease activity level was almost similar in both groups with mod with kind of mild to, well, kind of moderate, it's the day of four, so kind of moderate to act, uh, to slightly active disease activity. Right, thank you very much. No so we're going to conclude this session. Uh, doctor, I have a question. Okay. Just, uh, after the session, you can just go uh, to Dr. Okay. Fahim because of the time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll have a five to ten ish minute break. Please just come back, huh, so we can uh, proceed. Huh? Type. Why don't everybody just grab their coffee till we uh, and sit here? They cup their coffee. All, all are fine. We can proceed.